This is episode number 87, featuring artist Scott Christensen, and starting with this podcast, Something Brand New Inside. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it plein air. Others say plain air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. This podcast is brought to you by Fall Color Week. Every year I get a bunch of painters together and we just go paint the fall color. Where I live, I don't have any fall color and I love to paint. So it's just a chance and excuse to go painting, painting every day, all day. All you do is show up, roll out of bed every day. We have your meals served to you. You paint a couple of pieces a day. Some some of us paint three, four a day. You know, if you want to paint late night, do nocturnes, et cetera. And we just hang out at night. We play music. We sit around and tell stories to each other about our great painting adventures. There's no competition, no pressure, no show, no stress. It's just about painting with friends and being part of the whole plein air scene. This year, we're doing Fall Color Week in the amazing Canadian Rockies. Only time we're going there, so this is your chance. It's including visits to Banff and Lake Louise and the area. The place we're staying is like staying in Yosemite National Park and having El Capitan above you, only it's much, much, much bigger. And there's all kinds of incredible painting really right outside the door of your room. So you're going to have a great time. It's a resort. It's uh, you can If you want to take a day off and go hang out in the spa, go for it. It's fine with me. Anyway, all levels of painters are welcome. We're all equals here. So you could be painting next to somebody famous, or you could be painting next to somebody non-famous. We don't care. It's just a lot of fun. And so uh, learn more at fallcolorweek.com. This interview is underwritten by the Plein Air Salon bi-monthly art competition, which offers $27,000 in annual cash prizes, including $15,000 for the grand prize winner and the cover of Plein Air magazine. Bi-monthly winners also win features in our Plein Air Today newsletter. So enter your best studio or Plein Air paintings, and you'll be seen by prominent art gallery professionals who judge the competition and oftentimes famous artists, and inevitably... Uh, they will discover someone that they didn't know about when they're judging. So that's also pretty cool. We've, we've heard a lot of stories about people who have gotten picked up by galleries and stuff because they got noticed by a judge. Anyway, the entry deadline for this bi-monthly competition is the 30th of September. You've got a little time, but go ahead and get it done. Enter soon. Visit plenairsalon.com. Well, let's get right to our interview with the amazing Scott Christensen. I am uh, truly honored to have a, a very dear and old friend of mine on with us today, Scott Christensen. Welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. Oh, thanks, Eric. I appreciate it. So I'm expecting, uh, because uh, of, of the way you are, I'm expecting to break all listener records just because you're on the show. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> um, I can't imagine doing that, but uh, thanks for having me on the show. Well, you know, that's one of the things I like about you is that you're you're always very modest and and uh yet you're a rock star painter. How did this uh this painting thing begin? Now, I I, I got to tell you, I know the story because you told me when we were painting together in in Idaho one time. But nobody else out there may know the story. So, it didn't it have to do with a football injury or something? Yeah, in uh, in college I uh, Christmas C7 bird break. And um, as a senior, I was um, I had to quit because I was going numb to my waist for weeks at a time. And I didn't, I still wanted to play, but I found out that it was not a good idea. So anyway, I had to take an art class. This is the edited version. I had to take an art class for a credit. And uh, I wanted to uh, study to be a training coach and uh, just move on in, in education. I took this art class and I started liking it. And I just would, uh, I just take my paints and I'd disappear and go paint. And I had no idea I would be interested in it. And even though I was terrible, it uh, was just really a fun thing for me. It was something else I could pour my mind into. So that was a, that was kind of the edited version. And then it's gone on from there. 
Well, didn't you? But uh, I didn't it have it seems to me you said that, that some of the other jocks that you were on the team with were giving you a hard time because they didn't look at painting as something that was very cool. Um, I don't know that I, I got it more from the art teachers than I did the jocks. The art <laughs> teachers didn't, didn't like me much. So, um, but I, you know, I was, you know, they, I was a little bit challenging. I'm sure they used to want to see, they used to tell me how bad Sergeant was and then how good something was that was just absolutely terrible and tell me what I was supposed to like. And I was, I was really confused anyway. So it didn't help me any, um, but they didn't, I, you know, they just didn't, uh, didn't like the fact that I was competitive. I showed the javelin and things like that too. So, so um, you you didn't fit the mold of the normal person who took a, a high school art class or a college art class, I guess. Never, never really did. No, yeah. no. So what yeah. what was the transformational moment when you uh, when you actually learned how to do it well? How did that happen? Man, I, I'll tell you, Eric. I'm not even sure. Um, it's been well. It's I, been you know, a long, long, long time ago. <laughs> well, and also, I think I I had a long ways off my ignorance. I didn't know how bad I really was, so I thought I was actually doing better than I thought. And so I just kept, you know. I was, but you know how it is when you're starting; everything looks like you're you're progressing. And uh, even if you don't see it every time, you can kind of feel that you understand something different. And those little revelations take you a long ways. But I can't remember a day that I felt that way. But, well, uh, what, just so little, little revelations. Did you go uh, right out of college into becoming a full time artist? You know, I I was offered a job as a as a teacher and coach, for the, and I and a training coach also. Um, but you know, I I didn't. I decided to deliver newspapers for five hundred dollars a month to uh, vending machines so that I could start pursuing this art thing and. That wasn't everybody's favorite idea for me. They, they didn't say, uh, this is a really good idea. You should be an artist. And you just graduated and you got a job offer, but now you're delivering newspapers. So. But I took it really serious. I got up in the morning, dropped those things off, and I started painting a lot. And uh, like I said, I didn't know how bad I really was. But I, then I took a job the next year because I couldn't stand the idea that I had, little, I had my son and... Uh, and my wife and I was just like, I got to do something more. So I did that. I taught for one more year. I taught for a year after that at a public school, and then I quit and stayed full time at it. So, so that must have been a tough conversation with your wife. I I don't remember any conversation about any of that. Um, <clears throat> but you know, she knew I was pretty determined. But uh, she's very very good about it. Um, so do you have conversation? Do you remember when you enough. sold your first painting? Yeah, I sold the, uh, I sold them in, um, in college. I did have an art show before, when I um, graduated, so I sold them in the college there, and that was pretty shocking. I just had to get my money back for my frames, you know. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I was painting everything then: watercolor, acrylic. You, you tried everything, so. Like so, it was, you know, it was all right. I mean, just I didn't know how much I had to learn stuff. Well, knowing you, <clears throat> you're still going through that. Yeah, yeah. It's I've never studied more than I have now, and, and it's a lot more fun. I just uh, than it's ever been as far as the growth. I I've just taken on watercolors now more <clears throat> because I'm trying to understand the connectivity. Let's put it this way. I'm understanding more how Sargent was dealing with his water color and his connectivity to his oils. And it's helping me see different. And uh, But that's a constant thing. That's the fun part. So it's not always a comfortable thing because it's ambiguous and that's not everybody's favorite thing. But uh, but I like it. So would you keep it going. You'd be okay with me telling the story of uh, the transformation as a result of when you and I went to Russia? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell it my way and then you can tell the truth. Um, okay. <laughs> well, what okay. I, what I, 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 for, for everybody involved, uh, Scott and I, uh, I think first met when, um, Scott went on the fine art cruise from fine art connoisseur and, uh, we went to Russia for our first trip. That's about 10 years, eight or 10 years ago now. 
And uh, we went to the Russian Art Museum, uh, which, you know, the Her we went to all the museums, the Hermitage and so on. But I, I remember watching your eyes when you saw the Russian paintings, um, you know, the Levitans and the Shishkins and the, you know, the uh, Repin. Yeah. And watching you and, and you just kind of stayed glued the whole time. And I think if I remember correctly, you went back after we left and um, you you told me that you weren't sure that you could go back and paint again because these guys were so good that you didn't think you could ever live up to that. Do you want to tell us about that a little bit? Well, it was a, it was a, I think I definitely still think that, that was a defining moment for me because I realized just how good they were. And, you know, I started taking notes and writing and everything I had to try to understand what I was seeing because what I'm seeing is totally different than reproductions. And, uh, you know, and I realized that some of these guys would work on a painting for even up to a year or more and uh, larger painting. And I'm working on one now that, that I'm going to repaint the whole thing started over. And I've been, I've had it going for a year and a half, but I've had to get to a point where I'm comfortable with being a little bit, um, I don't, I wouldn't say you're comfortable. You just got to realize that there's a, I had to realize that somewhere in my career as a painter, I had to learn to live with the ambiguity and the discomfort of not knowing something and try to try to understand as best I can. For, for instance, um, I start building up surface, what I can do with it. And I saw, I saw everything in their work, you know, from edge work to, but it had such a raw authenticity to it. It wasn't, it wasn't just pretty, you know, it was, uh, it was just a, uh, it was a gut feeling that you got from it. And I didn't really explain that other than to say that it was this ambiguity that I had to start getting com comfortable with. And that was really the, because there's not so many things that are that concrete when you start getting into good painting to me. I mean, there, there's a lot of euphoria in finding your ideas and seeing your idea through, but that's presupposing you can sit with the ambiguity and, and try to be comfortable with it. And that's, that was what I learned by looking at their work, that they were, they were striving all the time to get better. You could just see everything that they were doing in it. And I, I tend to want to break paintings down and understand them more. And the more I did that, the more humbled I got and still am. So. Well, I remember talking to you about seven months after we went and you were still struggling and then I remember we talked again, uh, oh, it was probably two years after, and you said you had a, a major breakthrough. What, what is that experience like uh, to, to go through something like that? Because I, I remember how frustrated you were uh, feeling that, that your work didn't live up. And, of course, any of us who looked at your work would say it was magnificent, but you weren't happy with it. Yeah, I think that's just a... That's just an internal thing. I've developed a pretty critical eye, but I don't, I think I could be more discerning. I just, uh, I, I enjoy that part though. It's the, you know, I mean, when you look at a painting of Sargent, he does all these rocks, just, just a full set of rocks. And you're going, you can't, who does that? And, uh, and you make it look good. That's just, that's the second part that I don't understand. Um, I just, I, I don't know how I got through the frustration. I don't think I ever really, I don't think you ever really get through it. I'm not sure that, but I enjoy painting more than I ever have. So it's not like I'm just living in frustration. I'm, uh, I'm just enjoying the search a lot more and, and understanding that there's, I'm finding things along the way, if that makes sense. So that's, that's what keeps me going and uh, keeps so, the love of it really alive. So can you turn that into some advice for the people who are, listening what whatever level they're at whether they're highly accomplished or they're relatively new what what can you share with them from that experience that they can take home and use for themselves i would i would say that just be open to always um my friend larry moore says it best in his book uh, fishing for elephants he talks about um reframing your thinking and i think reframing your thinking is a big part of growing as an artist and you know, for instance, if I'm going to rework a painting, I might do a, a different palette over the top of one session. Then the next session, I might take like an Indian yellow, transparent red oxide, Prussian blue, and magnesium violet, some things I would never use necessarily. 
and I'll paint over the next that same painting again with a whole different palette. But I'm trying to I'm trying to get out some nuanced things that I've never I can't get any other way. So I try different things, and I I think you got to be willing to lose some of the best things you've ever done to try to take them beyond just academics and to something better. But that's the personal choice, and that's whatever you want, whatever that is for you. And I, quite frankly, I don't always know my intention when I'm going into these things. Uh, I know I'm trying to define it more before I start. But I would say that one of the biggest things is just reframing your thinking about how when you're looking at art, asking yourself, what, what are they doing? What's their intention? And what, what, what are they looking for? And how did, they, how did they do it? And the why behind it as well. And I think that studying art and breaking it down and understanding when you take certain elements out of a certain paintings that you know in history, you take a few elements out and it just changes the whole thing because it's, those things were important. And what did they put them in for? Why? You know, and just keep asking those questions and, and study an art and then uh, try to apply different things to it. And that becomes a lot more fun. It, it's, um, it, it just takes your understanding to a different level. And it's not all about making a painting one shot, you know. So when you break it down, if you're sitting in a museum staring at a painting and I've watched you do that, do you do you start from the beginning? Do you do you ask yourself, you know, how did they start that painting? What was their underpainting like? What was their process like? Or do you uh, do you go to that that length? You know, I do, Eric, but I'm not that smart. I can't, when I first see something that's really impressive to me, I almost can't look at it. I just kind of shake my head and walk away because I can't process it. Yet. And actually, it's kind of still working in my head, and I go back to it and back to it and back to it. And finally, then I'll start looking at it and breaking down what I'm, what I think I'm seeing, and then I'll start taking notes about it. But um, I'm just impressed when somebody can put something together and disguise your technique in it. I really have always liked that, and that's part of the thing I've been trying to do too: is not try to show real techniquey stuff, but you know, I can't. I'm trying to get away from painting like myself and uh, try new things all the time. <laughs> trying new things all the time so you know just uh, well listen but I think uh, most, most of us would like to paint like you so uh i'll take a little of that please <laughs> <laughs> you can have some of that um i just been, that's what i enjoy about painting so when you look at it you go how in the heck did they do that and, uh, and because the technique is so hidden in there you can't really you don't know the process of thinking sometimes and that's fascinating to me when you can't break it down because it's just it's uh you remember the painting, the, the hermit that Sergeant did, that's hanging at the Met? It's got the two deer and the hermit down, slain in the rocks down there. Yeah. And you just, you can't make him, first time you see it, you know, it's just chaos. That painting's just, how did he, how did he know he did anything worthwhile? It's just so chaotic when he came up to the surface of it. But when you back up and look at that thing, you just hold it together and it's, uh, I just, you just have to shake your head at some of that and you can't figure out how they did it and what they were thinking. But I know it's warm, cool everywhere. <laughs> it was just a, it was an amazing painting. And yet, you know, I don't know if I could have liked it early on because it's too confusing for me. And because uh, I just didn't, I couldn't understand it. And uh, I don't know. That's, but I think that's the fun part about art. Is it's like, you know, getting surprised by people and what they do and uh, what they come up with and, and just things that they'll do for techniques that are really different, that are not predictable. But, yeah, I'm not really answering any questions here. I'm just kind of talking out loud about paintings and how I how I look at them. And is, is there a way? Sure is, is there a way that you could articulate your perception of how your work has changed, let's say, in the last ten years? Well, I'm develop, trying to develop more layers and and some texture. I'm using more um, cold wax at times. Uh, I've had to overuse it to figure out how to rein it in. Um, I've tried to do. I just uh, trying to paint outside of my norm, whatever that is, and try to come about. I come about it really different now. <clears throat> so, I used to be pretty nervous about not losing things. I didn't want to lose them, so you kind of kind of scratch them to the end, <laughs> so you don't you know, just don't ruin anything you got started. But now I'm pretty free about losing a lot of things and bringing something else back into it. So you don't fall in love with something; you just keep working on it. Well, I think that's really important, actually, that you said that, because one of the things I've found is if I fall in love with something, I don't want to change the very thing that needs to change sometimes. Um, as a whole, it might not work, but as a, as a little piece, it might be interesting. 
and I'm finding myself um, it's not getting sold on everything too early. But it's not because I'm throwing dirt on my head or the whole thing as much as it is um, searching. You know, so it's, it's just a creative search is what it is, and it's it's what makes it exciting to me. The obstacle of creating work, the number one obstacle is to get a creative idea and come up with something that's really interesting with it. And it takes me a while to do that, to be quite honest. Uh, early on, I remember in, when I was painting, I was in my 20s and went out with a bunch of very good painters that were happened to come through Jackson at the time. And so about eight of us went out to paint and I was the youngest of the group. And I watched them all a little bit and I painted. And I think I did two or three studies that day. And one, of the, one or two of them hadn't even started a painting yet. And uh, they were looking and looking. Finally, they started. And the paintings were phenomenal. But they were they were talking about trying to come up with their ideas. And that, to me, you know, at the time, all I needed to do was volume. And that's, that's what I did. But then it became interesting to me that later on, I started understanding the process. And that is to look for an idea. After you painted a while, you try to, the idea generation is really everything. And that's the fun part. So. Um, that's what that's what baffles people, I think, the most is how, what do you paint next? You know, you have all these ideas, but where are you going to go with it, and how are you going to make it work? But are you are you pain, are idea. you painting out of your head? Uh, studio paintings out of your head? Or are you using a photo reference? Are you using a study that you've done on location? What wh- where are these yeah, are, I'll do, ideas coming I'll do, from? I do very uh, numerous studies outdoors and inside. Um, I'll uh, I'll be outdoors and make uh, when I'm looking at a scene I'll make marks on like paper and I'll write next to them what I'm seeing as far as value structure and color temperature and I can then I can use a even a bad photograph and come in and break something down to make it more like I saw it out there but I I don't trust the camera um, I definitely have to see it from life to really know what I'm looking at and then I. If I don't have to paint every time the whole painting as much as I like I said, I want to come back with the values and the colors I think I'm seeing to have the structural understanding of where I'm going to go with it. And, on, and I'll do little, little tiny paintings on, on paper. I'll do them on board. I'll do normal studies outdoors, sometimes larger, 1620s. But the real growth is observing. And I'm finding that uh, if I don't observe... Clearly, I, I can kind of make things up, and that that might work for a while. But I, and I think we all have to interpret something in front of us for sure. But I, but it's, I'm really more intent upon understanding what's really happening rather than just trying to always make it up. So, so knowing what you so that know takes now, a lot of I'm sorry. Go ahead. It just takes a lot of different variations of things for me to figure out where I'm going to go. So so knowing what you know people, now, Scott, um, based on uh, how many years? Forty years of painting. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you if you had to start from scratch today, knowing what you know now, what would you do differently? Uh, ask more questions early on, and and I would I'd probably have really considered a mentor that I think would could could help me find some shortcuts to it. That I think, but you don't know the questions to ask. You know, I, I didn't know the questions then. But I would ask the questions of a mentor, like, could you help me understand why, what their thinking process might be and walk you through it? I would look at all of these different painters and, and understand. I'd love to have a piece of a lot of their ingenuity and a lot of things that they do. And uh, I wish that I had to have more of a mentor at the beginning that I could spend time with. It was uh, just help me understand shortcuts, you know. Not, I wouldn't say there's that many shortcuts, but more of a learning to see and learning to develop your own critical eye and the why behind it. So, your that's what I, your okay. your workshops are um, quite a bit different than everybody else's. They're pretty long, um, a lot of depth. What what is your teaching process if somebody's coming to you and saying, "Hey, I want to be a part of this thing. I want to learn this." Uh, knowing what you know and how you approach things, um, what, what's your teaching process like? Well, I, um, to be honest with you, I don't do any long ones anymore. I do uh, four-day classes, and I'm oftentimes I do one 
20 person class or 18 or 16, I can't remember. And then the three, four to five people classes. And I'm spending way more time with people individually trying to help them spot some of their inconsistencies or things that they're doing that might work in one painting, but not another and try to try to help them figure their way through things that they're struggling with. And, uh, but I, I love to study and to give back as much as I can. It's, that's where I learn anyway. And so painting or teaching has become a lot more interesting to me than it ever has. Um, cause I'm, I'm learning myself all the time. So it's fun to share that and, and to learn from others as they're going to it's, I, I love to teach different things and I'm trying to simplify it actually. So I've noticed that one of the things that bothers me is when I'm, that I've noticed that every class for years is that when you really just start painting, when everybody gets their stuff out, that's where the panic starts. They, they kind of don't know where to start out there. It's, a, it's an overwhelming place. There's a lot out there. So I'll have them simply sit down and we'll start making marks and colors and values of things we think we're seeing. I won't even let them paint outdoors for the first one or something and say, okay, let's come back in now and let's break this down and see what we were seeing. We'll look at it in the image and try to get them to, to help them see like I'm trying to learn to see so that when I get out there, I have relationships that I can uh, make sense of. But uh, there's a lot involved in it. And I like to paint between three to four values mostly and uh, just get some organization to the shape making and variety that's pretty that's a nutshell but uh, yeah i love teaching the small classes they've, they've been a lot of fun so you you i want to just probe what you just said you said you're painting typically three to four values only so for the most part outside of accidents yeah outside of happy accidents happy little trees outside of no <laughs> yeah um, accents like the lightest light, the darkest dark, not counting those. Um, I'm just talking about values, the right. three, three to four values. Yeah. So a lot of color change here. So basically a dark, a medium, and a light, typically? Yeah, not always. Sometimes it depends on how light your key is going to be or your, you know, that, what type of key you want, how, what kind of key you want to put it in. How do you and determine it raise uh, it's a choice. Uh, you can't take it uh, for what it is outdoors and everything. You have to make a choice of what your one value is going to establish your next value. And if those are too dark, you just need to lift them all up to get to a higher key and decide which key you want first. And that decision can help carry the rest of the painting. So, so does that mean you're laying down your darkest dark first? I don't really have any... I usually do that, but not always. Um, just a big patterns first to understand what the big shapes are. And then to start breaking them down into finer shapes and things like that. But uh, I typically paint, paint from dark to light, but it's not unusual for me to come put my darks in at the end now. So it's not a absolute way. Yeah, I, did, I move around a lot. And, and are you, you know, some people try to keep their darks pretty thin and transparent. Are you one of those guys? Yeah, for the most part, until I started seeing it done different. And then I started <laughs> trying to. So recently, well, this is funny you're saying this, because I, I just had a painting work that I, I thought was working pretty well. And, um, you know, at the end of it, what I did was I mixed my two primaries together, yellow, red, and blue. And it got a, a really rich dark, and I put it right inside of a transparent thin dark and it just had all kinds of life to it and so there's you can put heavy paint inside of it but you just can't necessarily put it right on top i don't think it has to be you know again it was within a dark value already so it didn't jump out and uh yeah I, i'll do it put an in scrape it down put another you know there's no there's no best way for me but yeah i like it thinner from the beginning though for sure and I'm assuming you're starting with a thin under painting, um, you know, just a, with Gamsol or something or not? I usually use a, I want the paint to have enough integrity where if it were left alone, it could be, you could, you didn't want to have to touch it. And so I don't want it all washed and running everywhere. Um, <clears throat> you can see it where it runs on occasion, but that's because I want the viscosity as such that I can move the brush around and uh, cover a lot more surface that again depends on your that depends on your surface as well i mean like if i were using glasses in canvas i i couldn't use the kind of viscosity i use when i'm using the alkyd prime 
Uh, I've got a, I, I get too, if I'm too thin with the uh, Colossians, I don't like it. So I've got to thicken up my paint. So there's a lot of, a lot of things that factors, you know. Um, I, I watched um, a person in the class one time really struggling with, they couldn't, just couldn't get this, and the paintings to work and they were just struggling. And I, uh, I gave them a different canvas to try. And I'm not saying that canvas is going to solve all your problems, but um, they're, the way they use the viscosity of their paint, this one surface wasn't working for them. So they tried this other one I gave them and they just did a great painting. And so much so that she wiped it off and started another one and did another great painting. So I was super excited about the canvas thing. So well, in, in that particular case, what was it a, you, you said Alcott primed is, do you, is that kind of your standard or do you, you mix it up? I mix it up a bit. I, but I don't tend to use the uh, Fossens as much. It's a good, it's just a great canvas. I just have to change my viscosity when I start using it. And I just have to, it's a, I like to build up from thinner passages and gradually keep building. And I think I could do that more now with Fossens, but I couldn't earlier on because I kept the, uh, my paint pretty thin and it didn't really read very well on there. But um, I, I, tip, I typically use a pretty dry surface like an alkyl prime or even an acrylic prime on occasion. And, but, and are um, you looking for a lot of tooth or are you looking for something fairly smooth? Uh, both, right in between. Uh, I like to have a little tooth, but not, not so much that it's not really heavy, not really heavy. So you unless do- it's really a large surface. You you do a lot of really really big paintings. Um, Sometimes I do. I do a couple a year, but not. They don't always make it out there. I, I'll talk. You, you know, I you can see them. You see the process of me doing one maybe or something, but I doesn't mean it's out in the public yet. Um, so, so in fact, I, the one I'm, I've got a seventy. That one I'm reworking is a seventy by one ten, and I had it okay at some point where I thought I could, I could get it better and then I just didn't like where the idea was going so I was at it this morning I took a chisel after it and started taking paint off and, and uh, <laughs> sanding it and, and uh, but I'm happy to do this next idea on it and I'm really it's going to be fun it's just I, I don't mind it I just got I just learned so much doing it how do you have to approach a bigger painting like that differently um I, first off, you got to be in great shape, I think, because it really takes a lot of effort. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know how you approach it. You just, you definitely, I go at it pretty abstractly. So I definitely don't go at it with a. I know where I want to put things at times, and other times I just I cut loose and start trying to get some random going on in there. And uh, so there's never the best way for me. I but I'll come to it with that intention. Um, I might say, okay, this is too put together. Now I got to get some randomness scattered in there, and I'll start putting things like that in there, and it'll look maybe overdone or too rough or too busy. And I'll simplify it again. I don't. I don't have a certain way that I work. I just experiment a lot, so and that's where I find some of my best work. You're really pushing but, your limits. Well, I'm I'm trying to understand things in different ways, and I'm getting to things that I've never gotten before. I worked on this bush in the bottom right corner of the painting for, I don't know, three days, and by the time I'm done, and, you know, it's got a part of every part of the painting in it, but it was a lot of work of getting past it and painting it in such a way that I could see past it to the rest of the painting. So those things sometimes take more time than the actual center of interest, you know. And learn to subordinate and to to take things down when you need to is is a part in itself. Because um, I like to get things really busy, see if I can handle that much stuff, and then see if I can organize it again. And <laughs> it's just a this part of it. It's, I think the real intriguing thing about landscape to me is how many elements there are. You know, you get trees and rocks and bushes and every color, of different bushes and grass and. It's just not like some predictable thing. It's um, always different, and it moves. It, the, the light moves, and it's uh, it's crazy. It's hard to keep up with. But that's that's the fun of it, though. Well, you do you do so that's... much experimentation. But do you have any any uh, formulas or rules that you try to follow? For instance, you talked about the center of interest. Do you have a particular way that you approach composition typically or 
do you just kind of th throw care to the wind and just see what happens? Um, typically, I definitely don't do the care to the wind. I, uh, I'm most interested in unequal distribution of shape and scale. That is the most important thing for me as far as composing. Did you say if you have two, unequal? Unequal distribution of shape and scale. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If I can, if I can get divided, or surface areas that are divided up into different shapes and good shape making, that's usually the best start for me. Then I can try to break it up as much as I want and then try to organize it again. So, you know, you still want to break out of those masses and, and link things and try to find ways to move things around and give it variety. But sometimes it gets too chaotic and you got to come back to that simple read again. So I don't think it's the best way, but that's kind of how I go at it. Pretty vague, wasn't it? No, I didn't think it was vague <laughs> at all. It reminded me of okay. uh, Mondrian, um, the, you know, the modern artist and how he would have those uh, completely un unequal shapes, you know, not, no two shapes yeah. the same size. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, so important. I think that's probably the key to composing in, as far as I'm concerned. But, uh, you know, when I, I don't know if you ever remember listening to uh, Bach's Italian Concerto, where he was, he took Vivaldi's piece and tried to turn it into a, an orchestra using a harpsichord. And it's a long story, but it took him 10 years to, rewrite that thing and the infinite variation in there until somebody breaks it down and you hear it you just have no idea that there's that much going on if you can if you can find anything about that and listen to somebody break it down it's it's really fascinating because uh he's in one hand he's doing the cello with the harpsichord the other hand he's doing a soloist and it's all supposed to sound like an orchestra with just a harpsichord and you it's absolutely stunning to know that you could put that much thought and and really really hold it together with the varieties that you do. He wouldn't have all this yeah, you know, there's too much variety, it gets chaotic, as you know. And he was right on that edge all the time. And I think that's what's fascinating between, you know, you look at a profession too, and there's just so much interesting abstraction to it when you get up on top of it and you go, How did they do that? How do you do that or I didn't even think like that and uh you back up and it all comes together and you just shake your head and come back another day to study it again. So it's just amazing. Good painters are that way. They, there's, they're hiding all kinds of information in there, but it's, it's real well done. Sorry, I went on a tangent. No, 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 no. You, you didn't know. go on a tangent at all. It's, it's, I was just I was kind of <laughs> mesmerized and fascinated uh, with, with that part of the story. Well, we have uh, we have a lot of people listening who are um, at various levels. Scott, you, you, um, there there are probably not very many painters in the world who are at the level that you've accomplished. But um, everybody always, when I get feedback on these podcasts, they're always looking for you know, give me advice, give me some specifics. Uh, so I'm going to do yeah. a lightning round with you on this. The so first one is okay. uh, specifics for beginners. You know, if the, you know, three or four things that you want beginners to focus on. Oh boy, I think that's a really important thing. In fact, I treat myself as a beginner, so I always am doing this. I uh, to find the essence of where I'm going to start, exactly the value I want, the value relationship of the next thing, and the value relationship of the third thing, and do little tiny little oil paintings to try to understand the relationships before you even start. And then you can go, okay, I want to go lighter, lighter than this, darker than that. Warmer. You know, give yourself a chance to do a little studying before you start painting. Make sure you understand where you're going to go with it. Because otherwise you get started and you kind of, your, your good idea falls apart because you don't have any structure to it. And so I, I would say try to simplify your read and get those relationships as soon as you can. All right. That's true. That's a quick start, but that says it sounds simple, but that's where all paintings are made, I think. Well, it's 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 amazing to me how much those relationships matter and those shapes matter. You know, whenever oh I, whenever I'm struggling with a, with a piece, uh, you know, if I if I go back to the idea of of big shapes, it really it 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 helps me survive. Uh, you know, because I, the tendency is to want to put too much detail in. And sometimes yeah, you know, I think yeah. you put too much detail in, then you lose the big shape. Exactly, exactly. And you can do it in a way that you can still not lose the shape, but that's that's where the extra painting comes in. Yeah, how do you it's do that? I'd, I'd like, like to know that. Yeah. I'm struggling. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I do the same thing. I go through it, and it works. Next one doesn't. So, 
<laughs> as part of that process, I think, and um, getting used to it more. It, but I think if you can find yourself enjoying that thing, you search more, and you, you'll you'll be more there'll be more euphoria to your your finding your ideas and putting them together then, because you're going to allow yourself the luxury of, of not working every time. You know, you just got to try something new then. So just do your best job and try it again. Now, what about intermediate painters, uh, people who are beyond beginner and they're trying to get to the next level? I, I hear a lot of people say, I'm stuck. I, I can't get out of being stuck. Well, I don't know how to answer that because I'm always feeling stuck. But um, I think that's really the truth. Uh, I think you're always going to feel a little bit like you're just, you're always going to see more than you're able to paint. And I think that you, you once in a while you're going to do your new standard, which is your next best painting, but um, then that's your next one that you got to do better than. And I just don't live with that kind of, um, I don't think that I put that pressure on myself anymore. I, I Yes, I want to do good paintings. I want them all equally as good before I let them out, but real reality is it's not, it's not real. You gotta, you just gotta push on things and do your best. And, uh, but I think that the trying part, you know, giving it that you're extra, you're going to learn more if you try things, if you're not afraid to lose them. So you gotta be willing to lose them and, uh, to find out with some, uh, that next learning level, you know, I think being, being safe. I think being stuck is a good thing because it's, yeah. it, it's, yeah. It's forcing you in, into the next level of progress, forcing you to make decisions. I, boy, I sure think so. I think you're absolutely right on that. Yeah. And it, 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 um, if you're willing to take the challenge and also settle with the fact that it's going to feel ambiguous many times, it's going to feel like there's a discomfort in not knowing and uh, that that can be okay. Then the searching can start and then your curiosity can take over again. If so, you lose that curiosity, you start trying to find formulas, and those just kill you. They just kill you. Formulas kill you. I think so. Yeah. Everybody wants something linear to grab onto. And, and I think that the more you can learn to have a diverse thinking, you're going to try and experiment with things you've never done before, and then you're going to find your way doing things that you've never done before, and then your curiosity level will stay up. And if your curiosity level is up, you have a lot you can read from. A lot, of things, a lot of things you can do. So do you dream about you look, do you dream about painting uh, when you're sleeping? <laughs> I was obsessed last night before I came in and took my chisel after that big one. And uh, it's the painting's just bad. That's all I can say. And you know, I I just know what I want to do something to it, and I I've got a good idea, but I get really excited about it. You can't even sleep. I come out and I'll do little drawings and change portions change placement of things and and uh yeah i still get excited about it probably i went through a time where i was feeling stuck and i i didn't know what to do but that's one of the things that really helped me with uh oh, larry moore is a really good friend of mine and i wanted to bring it up only because of not name dropping but larry's book is about diverse thinking and it's about you know stretching your thinking you know more and not you know coming with it with intent but also you know, sometimes you got to have fun with it. you got to be willing to do some of those things. And you'll grow at that point. If you get too stuck on trying to find some linear that you can grab a hold of, and that's it, then once you get that taken care of and you think you understand that, then you get bored again. And you're thinking, well, I, that's all I can do. And it's not all you can do. There's just so many things you can grow with and find and uh, grab onto and try new things. I, I think that book is fascinating that way because I think it's a tough one for most people that are beginners because it doesn't give you a lot of things to hold on to. He's, he's very much talking about divergent thinking. So um, anyway, that, that book is called Fishing for Elephants, and I think maybe you've read it, Eric, but um, it's really interesting. And uh, I think when I'm around there, um, some friends of mine were always talking about stuff like that and how to – how to come at something different and what other people would, what other artists would do with certain areas and how they'd manage it compared to another artist. And those are all informative things that bring, you bring to your next paintings once you understand them. So, you know, that's, that's a pretty it. important element that I think people uh, sometimes fail to get is that the, the, the need for community. 
I know that yeah. you, you yeah. kind of go through spurts where you're alone for long periods of time working on paintings, and then you have you have your your friends that you you spend time with or your students, and and that community is really where a lot of growth comes from. I I couldn't agree more. I think it. And then we, we'll sit around, we won't even paint all the time until we decide what we want to do, and then we'll come at it with a real strong intention. And that's because we're studying a certain thing that we're trying to get past. And that's the way you learn. I think you have to interact. I think it, the interaction is a huge part of it. And to me, that's the most fun. I mean, when I go to watch, I go to watch pro, I have a friend who teaches the coach in the pro football team, and I, I go watch the practices and I listen to them. I listen to all the things that they're doing. It's such an art form now. There's so many things that you have to know before you can do them. That it's fascinating to me just to sit in on something completely different now. The game of football is so different than it used to be. But to actually listen to the strategy, understand what, what they're up against, how they're going to manage it. And those things are, I like to, not just in art, but other things too, are just so creative. And um, I, I think that's the beauty of art is you, you're inside yourself doing this your whole life and you're never going to, it's never going to end. And it's just so much to learn all the time. Any final thoughts yeah. for our, for our listeners? Try to have fun. That's it. <laughs> just uh, <laughs> make sure it's fun. If you're not having fun, you need to change something up. I think um, it's not always fun to fail, but it's also, but look at things that make you, make you excited again and start out. At, and uh, anyway, thank you. Thanks for having me on Eric. I appreciate it. Well, Scott, I've, I've, it's, it's really been a pleasure to have you on, and, and we'll do this again sometime. I have a hunch that we could go for hours and hours. You're such a fascinating yeah. guy. You've got such such a great heart and a different perspective, and it's uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, thanks, Eric. Appreciate it. Same with you. And it's been good to be on here talking art with you. Thanks. Thanks again. This has been the Plein Air Podcast with Plein Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about Plein Air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at pleinairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook. 240 plein air painting tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening. This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art. Proven techniques to turn your passion into profit. Well, hi there. People keep asking me marketing questions. So starting today, a new feature called the Marketing Minute. What I want to do is answer your questions about marketing because many of you, many of us want to sell our paintings and we want to have some success doing it. And so if that's of interest to you, that's what the Marketing Minute is for. I've got a question from Louise Murphy in Fredericksburg, Texas. What one marketing method would you use to get started if you're just starting out marketing? Well, Louise, I want to tell you that before you do anything, I know you're chomping at the bit to get out there. I know you really want to get your, your work out there and start selling your work. But you need to know where you're going before you go there, right? You don't get in a car without a destination. You know you want to know where you're going. So before you start marketing, you need to kind of outline your goals because that's what determines what tactics you need. So you want a strategy and then you want a tactic to, so tactics to support those. So I suggest you start small and don't overwhelm yourself with a whole bunch of big giant goals. Just a couple of things. What are one or two goals that you would just absolutely die for to accomplish in the next six months? For instance, if uh, you've not sold any of your paintings, maybe your goal is just to sell your first painting to get some money for it. That, that would be a good goal, a good starting goal. Or maybe it's to get somebody to sell your work for you. Maybe that's an art gallery. Maybe that's a local restaurant. Maybe that's something else. But so important that you set some goals before you do anything. Secondly, 
you need three really honest people who are professionals to tell you the truth, to tell you if you're ready, to tell you if you need to continue to work on something in your work. And I don't recommend you use family or close friends, but use some pros, contact some artists or some gallery owners or say, uh, somebody like that and just say, hey, I need you to be brutally honest with me. Uh, I don't want all the good things. I want the bad things. I want you to tell me if I'm ready. Uh, and Because you want to be ready. You want to make sure that you've kind of figured out if your work is ready for prime time, so to speak. So if two out of the three say you have a problem, then you probably need to fix it. If one out of the three says you have a problem, then you still need to fix that problem. But it's probably a go ahead, a green light that says go for it. So, but you want to address those problems and of course continually be growing by going to workshops and by going to uh, watching videos and things like that. So once you do those things though, Louise, then start collecting email addresses and mail addresses, physical mail addresses of people who are interested in your paintings and start building your website. Lots of companies out there that build websites for you that you can use that. But you want to kind of find a way to start showcasing your work and get used to, you know, just talking about your work and maybe blogging about your work. Once you've got a handful of people on that list, you're ready to start the next phase, which is getting those people to visit your website, maybe even interested in buying your painting. So I hope that helps. Question number two is from, I'm going to have trouble with this name, Koiko, K-Y-O-K-O, Koiko Ishigami of Princeville, Kauai in Hawaii. Wish I were there, Koiko. Her question, or his question, I'm not sure which it is, actually. I sell my paintings mostly through galleries, but I don't get information on the clients from the galleries. How can I ask galleries to share the information so that I can market and get repeat business? Koiko, that's a really great question. And that's a very important question because the money is made not on the first sale, it's on the repeat sale. What you want to do is get people to become collectors of your work, right? So uh, you do want to have the ability to market to these people. The problem is that galleries get burned by artists all the time, so they may not trust you. It may not be anything personal, but the problem is that if, um, let's say, uh, somebody walks into an art gallery, sees a painting they love, they, the art gallery won't sell them at the right price, they contact the artist direct. If you call the gallery, say, hey, send me that painting, and then you sell it direct, that's a big no-no, right? You don't want to do that because you're violating the trust of the gallery. The gallery is putting money into marketing you, putting you on their wall space. They're, they're giving time to you and attention. And so you really need to respect that and respect them. So basically what you want to do is have an agreement with your gallery. Every artist should have a written agreement anyway that kind of talks about what happens if they go bankrupt, what happens, how do you get your paintings back, who pays for shipping and all that kind of thing. But you also want to have an agreement that says, look, I will not sell direct, or if I do sell direct, I'm going to give you the commission. And so I had a situation where uh, I was in a show from our Cuba trip, and the, uh, um, the gallery had the show. They sold a couple of my paintings to this one collector. Months later after the show, I wasn't in that gallery anymore, but the gallery, uh, the collector called me and said, hey, uh, I'd like to buy this other painting that you have on Instagram. So I sold him that painting, and then I sold him two more, and then I uh, compensated the gallery because they're the ones that really created that collector relationship. And so that's the right thing to do. And of course, this you're in this for the long haul. So uh, the answer to that question, I know this is a long answer, but you want to have a good agreement that says in advance that you're never going to violate that. And I like to have an agreement that says, hey, look, I'd like to have the name and address of the buyer and contact information. I want to send them a thank you card. Uh, I'd be happy to copy you on any communication I have with them, and I'm not going to go direct. But you know, that way they're reading my newsletter, et cetera. If they do buy a painting from me direct, I'm going to give you the commission, the full commission, because that's what you deserve. So I think that's the right approach. The other thing I always do is I try to put my website on the back of the painting. And one thing I've done, and one thing you could do too, is you could write something on the back of the painting that says, you know, thank you for buying my painting, whoever you are. Uh, I'd like to give you a set of note cards with this painting on the note cards. If you'll contact me, here's my contact information. Just a little tip. Anyway, that's the marketing minute, the first marketing minute. You can send your questions to me, Eric, at plenairmagazine.com. Well, thanks again to Scott Christensen. Thank you, Scott. Uh, you've been a good friend uh, for many, many years, and uh, what an inspiration to us all. 
Today's podcast was sponsored, a reminder, by Fall Color Week. You need to get that booked pretty soon. It's coming up in October. Come paint with us in the Canadian Rockies. You can learn more at fallcolorweek.com. And also by the Plein Air Salon Bi-Monthly Art Competition, which offers $27,000 in cash prizes, not invisible prizes, not merchandise, cash prizes. Anyway, enter your best studio or plein air paintings. The entry deadline for the bi-monthly competition is September 30th. So enter soon. Visit plenairsalon.com. Also, if you've not seen my blog where I talk about life, art, and lots of other things, check it out. It's called Sunday Coffee, and you can find it on a special website, coffeewitheric.com. And then you can subscribe to it, and it'll come to you every Sunday morning. And it's up to uh, well over 100,000 readers now, which is really very cool. I'm very honored by that. And speaking of up to, uh, we're up to 392,927 listeners. 392,000 listening to a podcast about plein air painting. How cool is that? I'm telling you, the plein air movement is growing. This is so cool. Anyway, this is fun. Let's do it again sometime, like next week. I'll see you then. My name is Eric Rhodes. I'm the publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. Remember, it's a great, big, beautiful world out there. Go out and paint it. We'll see you. Bye-bye. This has been the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes. You can learn more at artmarketing.com.